thank our witnesses we have today. Uh, joining us over Zoom, we have Dr Ruth Fox, Director and Head of Research from the Hansard Society. Professor Meg Russell, Director of the Constitutional, Constitution Unit at the University College of London, and Dr Hannah White, Deputy Director, Institute for Government. Thank you very much for joining us today. We're very grateful and we're looking forward to hearing your views on how Parliament has uh, responded to the coronavirus pan pandemic. It will very much help us in our work on our inquiry on Parliament's response to coronavirus. Um, I'm going to start. Up, I'm going to kick off with questions straight away because uh, a lot of members do have to bob in and out. One of the joys of the new way of working is that members bob in and out to the chamber and other places virtually, and therefore uh, we will be seeing people coming in and out. But uh, if we can kick off with questions, and I think if I could just start, please, with um, uh, a fairly open question. I mean, clearly around the world, we've seen uh, chambers of legislatures adapt the, their processes and procedures to the challenges of the pandemic. So how well do you think the House of Commons adapted its procedures and practices to deal with the challenges? And what features of the Commons response stood out and where could the House have done better? Perhaps if we can start with uh, Dr. Ruth Fox. Well, I uh, described on, uh, on Twitter on one occasion that I thought Westminster's approach had been world leading, and I, I stand by that. I think in many respects, the, the range of proceedings, the speed at which it was done, um, the, particularly the remote voting system uh, getting up and running, starting from a, a scratch, I think was extraordinary and exceeded many people's expectations and including our own and, and you'll have seen that we I co-authored a, a blog post with uh with Meg Russell uh over the Easter break and we were not at all sure what virtu a virtual parliament would look like and what the technology would be able to offer and I think it it, it did extraordinarily well clearly we We've also always said from the outset it was it was not perfect, and compared to uh, you know, physical proceedings, there were clearly limitations. Interventions were difficult, debates were difficult. Um, I think the way in which the parties came together and the consultation that took place at the beginning and the the, the cross party nature of the approach was very good and very positive. And I think it's it's detrimental that that has clearly broken down. Um, I think. Where I would say that um, improvements could be made, I think, firstly, that that issue of consultation and a review process, you know, decision was made unilaterally to to effectively abandon the proceedings as initially uh, in place. And clearly, it would have been better had had there been a proper review process or a staged review process, as, as Meg and I had initially uh, envisaged in the, in the piece that we wrote. Um, and I think there are clearly some problems behind the scenes in terms of uh, members, ministers, the leader of the house, the chief whip's office, the engagement with officials and the broadcasting and technology team in terms of their understanding of the technology and what it can offer and its scope. And, and to my mind, a lot of the problems that have arisen and some of the confusion um, is based on assertions about the technology that I'm not sure are entirely true um, and its limitations and that there was actually more scope to do things and, and the technology, technological constraints have been used as a reason to stop doing things. Um, and I think that that has been detrimental. And obviously there's a concern about what if there were a second wave, what if there are is a national lockdown and so on, how would parliament uh, deal with, with that? We, we, still, we still don't know. Thank you. Professor Russell. Uh, well, I would really echo all of that, and there's no need to repeat some of the very important things that Ruth has, has said. I go, I go along with that entirely. Um, I think that if you compare us with other countries around the world, as, as you referred to in, in the question, yes, I would go along with the term world leading. I've, I felt very proud of some of the ways that Westminster responded in the early stages. I mean, you know, the, the work of, the, of many of the staff behind the scenes was really fantastic. I think your committee has done a wonderful job and, you know, there was great leadership from the presiding officers. But I think particularly knowing Westminster um, and knowing a bit about other countries around the world, um, I was very impressed with how inclusive the procedure was. Um, as Ruth mentioned, um, that post that we wrote over Easter, we were concerned that uh, 
some of the traditions of the Westminster Parliament are not very inclusive in as much as we don't really have um, we don't really have a central coordinating body that organizes parliament's business in the way that many other parliaments do um, and so there was quite an obvious body to take on coordination in a lot of other parliaments and we didn't have that but it seemed like we rose to the challenge um, and people got together through the commission through informal channels and came up with an agreement that was very kind of that was very cross-party, very consensual, um, which was an enormous relief. And um, the arrangements were inclusive in another sense as well, that the way that some other parliaments had responded was by essentially shutting a lot of members out of business and throw this very fast work behind the scenes, putting in place the virtual arrangements, not just for participation, but for voting as well, um, rather than um, creating changes which in effect empowered party whips which is what happened in many other parliaments around the world um, we managed to come up with in particular a voting system which maintained the freedom of every member to control their vote and that was done in super quick speed so i think those things you know that that emphasis on exclusive inclusivity both of decision making on the procedures but also allowing all members to participate equally was really, really admirable and impressive. Um, and then, as Ruth says, and maybe we'll come on to more, uh, what happened subsequently um, uh, around the wits and recess, I think was deeply regrettable in the way that those procedures ended because it was anything but an inclusive decision-making process to end the procedures. And the result was to exclude a lot of members initially from the vote. Um, on the 2nd of June, which was hugely problematic. But then from the procedures until some of those virtual participation mechanisms were put back on their feet. And even now in the substantive um, proceedings, members are excluded. And I think the proxy arrangements for voting are far inferior to the previous remote voting system. Right, do you have anything to add? Um, I would say, just to say, I, I, I agree with everything um, uh, that Ruth and Meg have said. Um, I think that, you know, in comparison to a lot of legislature, legislatures internationally, many of whom just close their doors <clears throat> or set up a very small committee uh, to sort of uh, work as a proxy house, uh, what the, the Commons uh, has done uh, initially was, was very impressive. Um, I think, you know, everyone's been feeling their way and knowledge has changed and we mustn't forget you know where we are now that we know a lot more than we did at the start and so decisions were made along the way based on the knowledge as it was as as we went along um just in terms of some of the weaknesses um i think um well firstly to say well, the strengths the thing that hasn't been mentioned so far particularly is the strength of select committees which i think again we might come on to but the fact that they sat all through the easter recess to provide scrutiny at a time when um the house wasn't sitting i think was really crucial and i think we've seen some really innov innovative work there um and um showing the value of the guesting procedure for example um in terms of uh weaknesses i think there's the there's a consultation um point that my colleagues have made there's also and i, I was thinking about this picking up reading the evidence um, of the sessions that you have had already there seems to me to be a, a potential conflict which you might want to reflect on, which comes to the fore in, in a situation, a crisis situation like this, which is between the legal responsibilities of the clerk, um, the administrative responsibilities of the speaker, and then the power of the executive to make decisions which might cut across both those um, res responsibilities and legal responsibilities. And I think that we've, we've probably been lucky that you know, there's been enough um, you know, uh, agreement um, b behind the scenes on the way to proceed. But, you know, the speaker was put into a position of having to say to the government, you know, no, we cannot um, use the lobbies at a time when, you know, the, the government's preference was to return to lobby voting. And I think coming down the track, we may have a situation where um, obviously the commission has agreed to stick with the two metre um, social distancing uh, it was evident from um, the leader's evidence that he's you know, not entirely delighted by that decision. And there was potential for, for conflict between these different uh, responsibilities and um, people with different powers, um, which is potentially you know, something to reflect on in a, in a crisis situation like this. 
And then just one final um, sort of very overarching point. I think that potentially what the whole of coronavirus has shown us is there's a, um, and I include myself in this, having been a former uh, House of Commons clerk, there's potentially a, a bit of a limitation to the imaginations that we've all had about the things that could go wrong and that could prevent the House sitting. <laughs> And, you know, something which involves social distancing really wasn't in anyone's plan. You know, there were, I know there's been a lot of planning, you know, I did planning when I was in the house about, you know, moving the whole of house, the House of Commons somewhere else if the site became unusable. But I think going forward, we really need to think about all the different sorts of things that could go wrong, because, you know, the next thing might be a massive denial of service attack, which meant that everything which is done electronically in the house can't be done. And then where would we be? So uh, uh, more contingency planning, I think, is something that is highlighted um, by, by the coronavirus uh, situation. Thank you very much. And we'll, we will have some questions on resilience later, because clearly we need to make sure the lessons that are learned are ones that we do uh, respond to and prepare for next time. And I would just put on the record my thanks to the staff of the House Service, because you've made the point uh, about the work that went on over the Eastern Wits and Recesses. We have asked an awful lot of our staff uh, clerks, committee clerks and uh, select committee clerks and of course house staff and I think we really do need to keep reminding people just how much work has gone into getting us to this point. Um, if I can now bring in Angela Eagler who I know will have to leave us after this question but has a question she'd like to ask about uh, scrutiny. Angela. Yes, thank you very much Chair. My apologies in advance to our esteemed witnesses for having to leave early. Um, I really uh, wanted to ask about your view of the scrutiny of government under the hybrid procedures. We, we have just all been patting ourselves on the back for having any capacity to scrutinise at all. And obviously that's been important. But um, given that the government has taken upon itself um, massive powers of virtually legislating anyway for the next couple of years under the coronavirus emergency legislation, that makes scrutiny even more important. Um, could you just say whether you think um, that is being done, uh, that, that scrutiny is, an, is possible under these quite limited circumstances? I speak as someone who didn't get in on the call list to even go into the Chancellor's statement today, just despite my long-standing <laughs> interest and activity in Treasury, it can be very frustrating. But how do you think that scrutiny is holding up under these uh, these uh, these hybrid procedures? Uh, perhaps, Professor Russell, you'd come in first. OK. Um... Well, I think it's it's clearly very difficult. I mean, you know, these are challenging times for the government as well as for Parliament. Um, and the sort of, you know, the speed with which policy has had to be made and the circumstances under which it's had to be made have been very, very difficult. But I think that to go back to that blog post, which Ruth and I wrote and published over the Easter break, one of the things which is perhaps notable um, in terms of the way that the House has responded is that whilst for all of the good things that um, we've already referred to, um, essentially um, the way that the House responded was to try and keep going with the standard procedures as far as possible. And one of the things that we suggested in that blog post was that there should be, um, th that that the House should go further than that and maybe look at what new procedures were needed for these special circumstances. And I think that one of the things that strikes me is, for example, the prominence um, that the daily Downing Street press conferences had day after day after day, um, whereas no change was made to the questioning procedures in Parliament itself. And one of the things that Ruth and I suggested was that you might have a, a new kind of procedure for urgent questions where there might be a standard expectation of two or three short urgent questions every day in order to ensure that Parliament was um, getting to ministers very quickly on some of the new announcements that were being made. We also suggested that perhaps um, the Prime Minister should be appearing more often than usual in front of the Liaison Committee. Um, which of, again would have been a, less often. Which would have been a kind of parallel to the Downing Street press conferences where he has appeared quite often. And so I think that Parliament could have done more. Um, but again, I think that 
you know, there is a fundamental here, which I, 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 I've, I think I'm likely through this session to keep coming back to over and over again, which is that one ultimately, you know, great strengths in the beginning, but the way that things have turned out, I think that one of the great weaknesses that has been shown up about the UK Parliament and the House of Commons in particular is the extent to which the government has exclusive decision making power over what the House does. Um, and so, you know, as, I, as I've already said, I think this committee has done fantastic work in, you know, thinking imaginatively about what needs doing, making practical suggestions, advocating for those practical suggestions, but so much of the initiative in the UK system comes from the government, and of course, um, you know, governments naturally um, shy away from scrutiny unless they're um, forced to be subject to it quite often. I think there's an, there's a, there's an additional point about the delegated powers um, where I think Ruth uh, you know, is very expert on that and I'm sure will comment. There have clearly been concerns about the extent to which uh, major changes have been announced very quickly without there being and, and actually introduced without there being adequate time for Parliament to even look at the proposals. Sometimes those have been things which had been under discussion for weeks in advance um, of the statutory instrument being published and yet it comes into effect almost immediately and on some of those things we knew that there was um, concern on the back benches, things like the quarantine arrangements. Um, but Ruth would have a lot more to say on the 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 day-to-day the -day ins and outs of um, of that oversight, I think. Than I'd me. like to come to Ruth in a minute, if possible. I just want to ask Dr. White about another aspect of scrutiny, which I think has um, has um, gone downhill rapidly uh, in the crisis, and that is the um, timeliness and quality of answers to parliamentary questions from departments. And also, and you may not have seen this in, in quite the same way as we have as MPs, but the perfunctory nature of some of the answers to letters to ministers, um, just to keep you in the loop, what has begun to happen is several departments, including the Treasury and the Department of Health, have stopped answering letters, uh, have stopped ministers answering letters at all from MPs, and actually merely provided in the Treasury's case a kind of standard four page um, list of propaganda announcements for every letter that you send in. And in the Health Department's case, uh, letters signed by civil servants, uh, of which there's no obvious um, ministerial sign off of any kind. I wondered if you might comment how that deterioration impacts on scrutiny because I found it not only maddening but I actually uh, I think it's a serious dereliction of the government's duty. Yes yeah, so as you say um, you know we haven't got visibility of the of the sort of letter um, writing um, that, that MPs engage in and, and how those answers are coming through but I've seen in the evidence that you've received the concerns that members have about um, questions certainly. Um, I do think you know obviously certain government departments have been very busy but at the same time um, the whole um, thrust of, of what Meg said is true that you know a lot of very significant policy is being made very rapidly legislation is being highly complex legislation is being drafted and the point of the scrutiny process you know is 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 to ensure that the the problems that could have been inadvertently introduced there or of which the government may be unaware because members are talking to their constituents and and understanding you know unintended consequences and so on that they need to bring to the attention of government you know if there aren't mechanisms effective mechanisms for that to happen then that is really problematic i think in a, a crisis situation and i think it's it's a little bit contradictory that the leader has sort of put a, a big emphasis on on needing to have um uh, debates in person in the House in order to have, you know, better quality debate um, and say that, you know, a minister can only really be properly held to account if there can be numerous follow ups and interventions and so on. And it, it just sort of leaves me thinking, well, well what if the, the, the minister, you know, made a point of, of, of giving a full and frank <laughs> statement in the first place so they didn't have to be chased up for their answers. And I think the same applies um, to, to parliamentary questions, actually, you know, 
full and timely questions would mean that you know some of these uh, deficiencies which have been identified in the way the chamber is operating might be less significant if members felt that you know they could um, get timely answers to parliamentary questions it wouldn't be so um, problematic for them if they couldn't then get into question time in the chamber for, for example because of the social distancing. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, Dr. Fox, I wonder if you might make some um, some observations about the statutory instrument procedure, particularly the very late tabling of some of uh, of some of the most important ones, which has left the law changed by statutory instrument, but without parliamentary scrutiny at all. Well, one of the, the, the problems is it's not a product, I think, of the of the the pandemic or of, of the virtual parliament or anything like that. It, it's, a, it's a product of, of the way in which delegated legislation has worked for years, is that if there are urgent procedures, urgent powers on the statute book that can be used by ministers and those are not constrained, then ministers can use them in these kinds of circumstances. And what we've seen is that they've made fairly extensive use of the made affirmative procedure to bring a statutory instrument forward um, the lockdown regulations, the provisions around um, wearing a face mask on public transport and so on, um, bringing those forward, you know, so in some cases less than 15, 16 hours before they were due to come into force. And as Meg said, they had been clearly headlined in uh, in the media and in public debate for, for days and in some instances weeks beforehand. So the question is, were they urgent? And, and the problem is that the power exists and it doesn't have any constraint on it other than that the minister deems it to be urgent. That's the problem. And you go back, therefore, to the to the scrutiny and work that has to be done to constrain those powers in bills in the first place. Um, I think, however, we shouldn't get too we shouldn't idealize too much the idea that if those statutory instruments had been laid in advance that have been a huge amount of engagement with them because we know that delegated legislation committees um, very often are you know not terribly well attended there's not a great deal of participation and part of that of course is the long-running problem that you can't amend them um, and it's an accept or reject situation so a lot of members understandably don't engage with them and if you look at the lockdown regulations which are some of the most serious you know changes to our liberties that we've seen um, very few MPs actually took part in in, in, in those debates um, and I have to say very few members of the opposition parties took place in took part in those debates they were predominantly government um, backbenchers. Now I understand why, because you know those provisions had been in force for several weeks before they came to be debated, and that's the problem with the with the procedure. Um, and you know, in in a sense, it, it it has brought to life, in a way, even the Brexit regulations didn't bring to life some of the difficulties and problems with the way in which Parliament, the House of Commons, can, can scrutinise uh, SIs. I, th I think that, um, uh, Chair, that's uh, an extremely important point, especially given the increasing uh, capacity or, or almost custom of the government to make its primary legislation almost just a series of hooks to hang secondary legislation on, and perhaps that's something the committee uh, should think about later. I, I would also make one final comment. I know that um, opposition MPs have been discouraged from going to statutory instruments where uh, there isn't opposition uh, to voting against it simply because of the social distancing issues and trying to, to do um, what is only necessary. And I suspect that if we'd had some kind of hybridity that was possible for statutory instruments, that might have been different. But uh, Chair, thank you very much. Thank you. Kevin Jones wants to come in. Well, the statutory instrument this morning did speak for at least 10 minutes, so, uh, uh, but I, I do accept the point that uh, Angela makes. But I think the other thing which you talk about scrutiny of the executive is the way the chamber's working. Um, we're increasingly getting down to time limits of between three and four minutes uh, to try and get as many people in as possible, which is leading to uh, ministers not well people basically come in reading into the record rather than making a speech uh, and then ministers not re to responding to any of the uh, points in the wind up just because of the volume of uh, individuals but also a habit which has been creeping in the last few years of both opposition and front bench spokes uh, people coming forward and reading set speeches rather than answering the debate 
But that has limited, I think, because there are a lot of um, issues that I think have been raised, certainly with me and I think a lot of other members, uh, in terms of particular way in which regulations have been implemented locally. Um, I fully understand the uh, special circumstances, but the only opposition we've, the only position we've got is to write to the minister. And as has already been said, all we're getting back is, frankly, uh, non-answers. Um, so I think it's a quite important thing, Chair, that really our ability as parliamentarians across the House to scrutinise the executive is actually being very limited. And I think, to be honest, the time limit on these debates, I've never been in favour of time limits personally, uh, but something needs to happen because uh, all we're getting now is people coming, reading, reading what they have to into the, into the record, and that's it. And that's not scrutiny. And I think we can all agree that one of the deficiencies with the fully hybrid parliament was that it was just a succession of speeches that were read out with no interventions, and at least with interventions and spontaneity you do get debate. But I absolutely agree with uh, Kevin about the point about wind-ups. There simply isn't time at the end for a minister or an opposition spokesman to properly wind up. And a debate does need to reflect, the wind-up needs to reflect what the debate had in it, not, uh, not just... Uh, a, a series of pre-prepared points that need to be made. Um, I'm going to, of course. It's been a tendency, I think, over the last few years, though, for ministers. I mean, it irritates me dearly if, I've, uh, if I'm there. Is that you get ministers who come with a pre-prepared written speech, and I've got to say, certain opposition front benches do the same. And all that all they do is refer to the people that have actually spoken in the debate. They don't actually say what those individuals have said, yeah. and. To be honest, I think it's just lazy, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not about scrutiny. I think it's something the speaker needs to needs to pull, start pulling ministers and uh, front benches up on. Okay. Well, these are all points we can we can come to that are more wide than just the uh, procedures under coronavirus restrictions. Can I bring Jack Brereton in now, um, who's got some questions about the way business was conducted during the uh, fully hybrid proceedings in April and May? Thank you, Chair. And yes, I particularly um, want to concentrate on the scheduling of business. And obviously, during the hybrid proceedings, uh, this was done uh, through a, a motion that was signed by the Leader of the House and his counterparts, the two uh, largest opposition parties. And as we've touched on earlier, this is obviously different from um, uh, previously. So could, could the witnesses just please um, outline what is different in this approach to um, the usual arrangements we would see uh, for determining Commons business. Want to start with that? that. Ruth, do you want to? Sorry, I missed that. Um, well, clearly, uh, in those early days, it was almost as if we had a we had a form of business committee. Um, it's, happening um but um very rapidly as the as the, the liaison between the parties and the sort of the, the cross-party nature of things deteriorated that be becomes more difficult i think for me the the interesting aspects of the scheduling of business um were why why the members signed up to a three-day week on an ongoing basis three day sitting week, because that naturally constrained what business could take place. And it had the effect in terms of things like question time, having to, re to, to restructure the timetable, having to reduce the amount of time available uh, for oral questions at certain points, and obviously limited the range of business, and therefore the range of, of options and opportunities for, for changes and adjustments to be made to business that were available. Um, and, and there is, I think, a, a, a real question about why, why they stuck with three sitting days when the House of Lords has been able to sit for four. The House of Lords, I understand, is planning to sit five days a week, uh, at least one week before recess. I mean, the um, suggestion that we were given um, of why uh, we were going for three days was because obviously the technology had only just been introduced and the capabilities of that um, it was feared would not be able to go beyond um, three days. So, the, and, and obviously uh, Thursdays until recently have been often used more for backbench business and opposition days, which 
were not happening so much uh, during the that that period. So, it, is it more that um, you know that that we could have done that, or do you think it is um, you know just that um, th there was a reluctance to to have um, uh, four days a week? I think there was probably a reluctance to have four days a week, um, but but why why the question of why it was not possible to have more capacity after the first couple of weeks when the system had settled down uh, is very unclear. Um, and consequently, you know, you could have had you could have had some adjournment debates, which would have enabled members to focus on their either their very focused on their constituency matters, or you could have even been raising questions about the lack of responses to ministerial correspondence. Some of the of the e-petition debates could perhaps have taken place. I know that there'll be limitations to the to the nature of those debates that we, we're all aware of, but it would have provided some capacity. It would also have enabled questions. To, to happen for a, for an additional day that week to to reflect on you know what might be coming up in the uh, over the weekend, um, so I think I, th I do think that was problematic and I think given that the House of Lords has been able to to sit for four days, my understanding is the House of Commons, whether that's at the ministerial level or the official level, they never asked to do more than three days, whereas the House of Lords did, and consequently they got more than more than three days. So, um, do either Meg or Hannah have any um, points for, for my original question about um, the um, uh, how it differs from the usual arrangements that, that would be in place? I just wanted to, to build on something Ruth was saying, so it wasn't an answer to that original question. Of course, do carry on. And I'm going to bring Chris Elmore in, but Hannah, do. I, I just wanted to say that I... I I think that what Ruth is um, is talking about is symptomatic of a sort of a wider approach which the government has taken um, in the, these circumstances, which is to see the um, technological capability which was sort of brought in immediately after Easter as a sort of static offer, um, and that there were other um, options that could have been explored that were being explored, both around um, holding virtual public bill committees. Um, uh, also, uh, as, as Ruth said, the, as people became more confident in the capacity of the technology, it was possible to sit for longer, to sit with fewer breaks, um, although they, those may be separately desirable from a socially, social distancing um, point of view. And I think that you know, if you look internationally, um, for example, at the Brazilian parliament, they have a, a system where it's possible for members to do something a bit like on um, on Microsoft Teams and Zoom, where you sort of raise your hand if you want to intervene in a debate. Members can register to do that. So the big objection, which has been um, you know held up to to um, the hybrid system, saying that you can't have um, uh, spontaneity of debate and you can't have interventions. Actually, in, in the Brazilian Parliament, they they do have the the ability to do that technologically. And yes, it's you know it's complicated and it's not. Um, necessarily you know easy for the chair to manage but it can be done and I just think that you know if some of these things had been allowed a little more time to develop um, it's um, you know, some of the problems which were perceived with the, the old system could have could have been resolved to some extent and I think in the in the longer term um, you might want to think about whether um, because of the potential for a second wave or for a, a, a sort of a localized lockdown in, in Westminster or something is there work that you would like the House of Commons authorities to continue with. I mean, it may it may just be um, a case of observing what's going on in the House of Lords, but are there areas of exploration which would be sensible to look at? Because, you know, we cannot guarantee that we might not go back into a situation where um, the, the physical proceedings become difficult again. Are there things that would be sensible to explore in the meantime um, of, of those sort of nature? I think, Meg, you wanted to come in on that as well, did you? Yeah, I was. I was. I, I totally agree with everything that Hannah has just said there, and I was very interested by the um, the evidence from, that you heard from the clerk as to how more and more time could have been put into looking at creating spontaneity in hybrid debates um, had had it run for longer. But I wanted to come in on the original um, question um, about how those arrangements differed from the typical arrangements. Of course, the typical arrangements are that the house is very often given things on a largely take it or leave it basis by the government in terms of what its business is, is going to be. Um, and Ruth said that um, the inclusion of particularly the, the, the opposition leader uh, in discussions was sort of 
a bit like the creation of a business committee, which is something that could be seen as a step towards a more inclusive way of making decisions. But I would say, I mean, a bit of my pedigree is that I was the specialist advisor to the right committee, the Select Committee on the Reform of the House of Commons, which reported 11 years ago. And one of the really the central question uh, which that committee looked at was the extent to which, aside from the Select Committees where it did important work, um, but in terms of the agenda, um, its real central puzzle was how the House of Commons could be given more control over what it discussed and when. And the, the way the right committee saw it, and I completely agree with this analysis, one step along the road to that um, is the creation of some kind of cross-party, um, well, it called a House Business Committee, the sort of thing which we were seeing sort of in embryonic form emerging at the early stage of the stages of the crisis. And essentially at the very early stages, it had to be done by consensus because you couldn't get members into the chamber for a vote at the very beginning. Well, but it's, it's... A bit further on that because it, it obviously worked very well when there was consensus and when those parties agreeing amongst each other about the business that needed to be considered. But what seemed to be the case was that when the we came across more controversial things, such as the immigration bill and others, um, you know, those sorts of pieces of legislation, it was not possible to maintain that consensus because the government wouldn't have been able to schedule uh, those controversial pieces of legislation if it hadn't um, uh, regained control. So in, in terms of you know, progressing its own legislation and making sure that not just uh, non-controversial legislation is in place, um, how would that sort of system work with those uh, pieces of legislation where there isn't consensus? Mm. Well, I think that, that would fit with what I, what I was going to say, which is that one step is to have some kind of cross-party forum where these things are discussed, but the right committee never thought that that was enough and never thought that some kind of um, usual channels agreement between leaders of parties was the right way of making decisions. It felt that the House itself should be the place where those decisions were made. So the suggestion that came from the right committee was that a house business committee would draw up a weekly program like the like the business statement that we have normally had on a Thursday afternoon from the leader um, and that actually that would be put to a vote in the chamber and I think that that principle had that been applied during the crisis there were times when it couldn't be as I've said at the very early stages but I think that one of the problems that we've seen in the later stages of the crisis is the government assuming that because it has a majority in the House, because it has a partisan majority in the House, that a majority of the House will necessarily be on its side on some of these decisions. And I think that there are times when quite possibly a majority in the House wouldn't have been on its side on those decisions. Now, if it wants to put a programme to get its legislation adequate time, um, and the government's backbenchers support the government, then of course it will always win the vote. But there are occasions like, you know, we saw it, for example, on the, uh, the implementation of the changes with respect to bullying. You cannot assume that just because something comes from the government as a proposal, that it will have a majority across the House in support. And I don't think there's any clear indication that there was a majority across the House um, to end the hybrid arrangements, given that so many people were disenfranchised from the vote on the 2nd of June. Um, so I think that the, the move from cross-party agreement is one possible way of showing that there might be support across the House, but ultimately the way of knowing that is to put decisions to the House itself um, to, to make I, I am still a little bit, I'm still a little bit puzzled about how, um, if we're going to have that sort of committee um, deciding business, how the government gets through its legislation. And, you know, I think the, the as we've seen and, and what happened, um, there were pieces of legislation that were more controversial, which it was unable to table because um, of, of that process. Do, do either of our other witnesses have any thoughts about how that would work if, you know, it's all well and good when we have non-controversial uh, legislation, but things that have been um, elect the government's been elected on in their manifesto, surely the government should be able to put those pieces of legislation forward and, uh, and secure them time within within the Commons. For the witnesses, like 
come in. Could I bring in Chris Elmore and Liz Twist, who both think I think are keen to make a comment? But Chris Elmore and Liz, and then we'll go back to the witnesses to answer those questions. Thank you, Chair. I think in particular to Dr Fox's comments um, about the three-day sitting week. Of course, I, and I know um, that all the witnesses will be aware of this, there were occasions in the three-day sitting week when actually the House rose early. And that in itself is a problem because there was, there was business not put on the basis that it wasn't consensual. But actually, there have been various bills since the House has returned since Whitson that have, that have not had divisions, regardless of, 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 of an e-voting system or, a, or a, uh, a, a, the, the conga line, as it's now become known, or the proxy voting that, that has now followed. There's been multiple bits of government business in that case. And also to come to what I think Professor Russell said in relation to the clerk's evidence last week, but also over multiple sessions we've, we've had with the clerk and indeed with the leader of the House over virtual public bill committees. I just wonder what Professor Russell's view would be that there was testing for hybrid public bill committees or virtual public bill committees. There could have been an option to bring legislation forward, including controversial legislation. I was part of those negotiations through, um, uh, through usual channels. And indeed, House staff had initially been commissioned to undertake additional virtual proceedings, and then they were cancelled by government. So I, I just, to add to what, um, Mr. Barrett has said, I think it's important to know that actually those things were going on and we could have done it if we've chosen to, which I accept is what you've said in essence, but it's important to put it on the record. Liz Twiston, and then I'm going to come back to the witnesses. Liz. Uh, yes, thank you. I was just looking at the uh, evidence from the Hansard Society and particularly noticing the bit that I don't think we touched upon about e petitions and backbench business and how that fits in. And I just wondered what you thought the impact of the lack of those debates might have uh, had on the kind of vibrancy of Parliament and reflection of public opinion. Perhaps if we can start with uh, Professor Russell, and I think I think the key point here is the committee is keen to make sure that that there's nothing in the future that can hinder and hamper government doing what it needs to do and Parliament scrutinising it. So I think thoughts about how what were what were the things stopping government, in your view, from bringing business forward before Whitson, because that was clearly a point that's been made to us by government as to why why things had to change after Whitson was difficulty in bringing uh, legislation forward. And then uh, and, and then all those other points, including, as uh, Liz Twister said, about the backbench business petitions, etc., which are simply not happening uh, in the way they used to uh, and didn't happen at all during the hybrid proceedings, but certainly aren't happening now even as much as they should. Uh, Professor Russell, can I start with you? Well, I think on um, Chris Elmore's question about the public bill committees, um, I've read your evidence and it's a bit of a mystery to me. I don't know whether any of the other witnesses understand better, um, but I read your evidence with the leader from last week where it was you know, not the first time that you've pressed him on this and the point was made that there was capacity to hold two public bill committees um, in person, that there was the capacity for virtual public bill committees. And reading the evidence, I'm genuinely perplexed as to what was going on. It looks like maybe there was some kind of internal communication error or something, because it feels like committees were possible, and yet they were not happening. Um, and you may have better information on that than me. On the, on the point that Jack Brereton was making about the government getting its business, I absolutely agree that the, you know you shouldn't you shouldn't expect to, in normal times, have a committee which, you know, by which you reach cross-party consensus on what the business should be. And you can't be in a position where, on a day-to-day -day basis, the opposition has a veto on what government business can be put, clearly. But the point that I'm making, and, and it is consistent with what the right committee recommended all those years ago, which never happened, is that ultimately it should be for the House to decide. And if the government has a majority in the House, then the government should have no difficulty getting its, getting its programme agreed, not, not, the, not you know, the business itself ultimately, but the programme, the, 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 the use of time. Um, but there hasn't of late been an opportunity, and there isn't by standard an opportunity for the view of the House to be tested on what the House should be spending its time on. That system actually operates in the Scottish Parliament. It operates in some other parliaments around the world. And I think that rather than, I think one of the difficulties that we have with the standing orders in the House of Commons is that it is too often taken as an assumption 
that the government speaks for a stable majority. Um, you know, the government often has a majority in the House, um, but that doesn't mean that the House should be routinely delegating decision making to the government. It should be for the government to propose to the House and for the House to decide whether it wants that. And if the government indeed has a stable partisan majority, that should never be a problem for the government. It shouldn't be afraid to test the opinion of the House. Dr White, did you have anything to add? I don't think I have anything to add. And uh, Dr Fox? If I just perhaps pick up on the, the, the issue about e-petitions and adjournment debates and so on. Um, I mean, clearly, at the height of the pandemic, these were not the critical bits of business compared to ministerial statements, urgent questions, PMQs and so on. But as time went on, as the capacity of the system built up, I think that is where um, the expansion of proceedings and the use of the technology could have helped. We could have, we could have had um, you know, German-style debates. We could have had e-petition debates, backbench business debates. And the nature of them in terms of interventions is slightly different to the way it operates in terms of, of public bill committees, for example, or, or legislative debates. So um, in terms of the number of participants in an adjournment debate, for example, it, the, the use of the technology would have been less problematic than it is in a, a, a legislative debate. I think the e-petitions is particularly problematic because, of course, that is how so many members of the public engage with the House. It's, it's the House of Commons Parliament's sort of front door for, for the public. Um, and by wits and recess, we had 22 e-petitions, I think, that had, had passed the 100,000 threshold and hadn't, hadn't been debated. Um, so I do think that is problematic, particularly when you think that the e-petition system had been closed for many months already because of the general election and the length of time it took to set up committees. So for members of the public looking on who suddenly were able to get onto the system, sign up to these petitions, to then not find that they were able to, to get them debated in a timely way, I think, I think is, is, is problematic. And given there, were, there was the capacity to have, to have used the, the virtual proceedings in a, in a broader way in an additional day, I think that could have been dealt with. Um, and I think that if we end up in a situation with a second wave, um, you know, that is an area which could be looked at. Question on scrutiny and the way that Parliament is able to scrutinise, and that's coming from Owen Thompson. Then we're going to move on to uh, how we actually manage our proceedings in the Chamber. So, Owen. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Chair. Um, Dr Fox and Professor Russell, um, you, you've said that the, the current crisis and Parliament's response to it um, should not become a pretext to shift power further towards the executive and party managers. And that also fits in with comments that uh, Dr. White had, um, previously made in, in an answer. But isn't some form of party business management going to be inevitable, particularly in a situation like we're currently in? I, I don't mind who who wants to come in first. <laughs> My, a, Professor a, Russell, why don't you come in? <laughs> um, well, I think that those are those those two statements are not inconsistent at all. The idea that you 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 need to have party management, of course you do. You know, the House of Commons is a is a big and complicated place, 650 members. Um, there has to be some delegation of decision making. Um, but at the same time, that the crisis shouldn't be an opportunity to strengthen the power. Uh, of the government and the whips, um, you know, that there's an acknowledgement there that that power exists, but that it's, it, it, it shouldn't necessarily go further than it already does. And I fear that um, what we've seen is some strengthening in that direction. I mean, one of the obvious examples of that, and I'm not sure, um, you know, you other people there on the ground watching it day to day, how it's working, but it certainly looked to me like the way that the shift to proxy votes happened with the great majority of those proxy votes being given to whips was exactly the kind of thing that I didn't want to see happen. And as I said at the start, I was very pleased and proud um, that the House authorities managed to put an arrangement in place whereby each member could retain their own individual vote. And we now have a situation where party whips on all sides are holding in their back pocket a very large number of votes, which is the kind of thing that I had seen um, 
with you know some uh puzzlement and horror in studying other parliaments and i felt very glad that we'd never had anything like that here um and i think that the way that the um the way that the government has made some of these latter decisions um has looked very centralizing i mean i must say you've had evidence from the government um now yeah i saw that you had written evidence that was received yesterday which was copied to us as as witnesses and i was so struck by one of the lines in there um at the beginning at the end of the first section uh, and i quote um it says in order to see parliament fulfill its full constitutional role the decision was taken by the government that parliament needed to get back to physical proceedings mm. now i just don't feel that's an appropriate attitude or an appropriate why how can a decision be taken by government the decision should be taken by parliament um and too often we fall into this kind of elision between assuming as i've said that a government with a majority can speak for parliament parliament exists independent of government the government only is the government because it has the support of parliament and it should be for parliament to take these decisions not government I'm conscious of time and I know there's quite a few areas we need to cover so if we can move on and if perhaps for the witnesses if you have something to I'll bring one of you in and perhaps if you have something to add in addition to that if you could raise your hand I'll make sure I bring you in at that, that point but if we can move to the way that proceedings are actually happening in the chamber at the moment and if I can bring in one of the holders of many proxy votes as a whip Chris Elmore I was going to make the public confession, Chair, just for the avoidance of doubt, although actually temporarily um, I, I, don't, I don't actually hold them. Um, and, I, and I think on that point, before I come to the chamber management, is that actually I think I can speak for all the collective opposition and probably some government members as well, that this actually wasn't our preferred model. A lot, lots of us thought the e-voting system was, was working perfectly well um, and with the multiple tests that took place showed how well it could work. Um, and, and actually the proxy system allows those colleagues who do have to stay at home for medical reasons or following advice of devolved governments or childcare issues at least gives them some flexibility to vote. But I do agree with what the last the last comments about the, the overall purpose of it. It isn't particularly a positive thing, although I'm sure my chief wouldn't 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 agree. On the um chamber management, and I think all the witnesses have made comments on this, so you know, so please don't feel the need to add to anything that you said, but please do if there are specifics where you'd like to expand on. The House has continued to meet in a socially distance throughout the pandemic, as, as we've discussed. The Commission has agreed now to keep to the two metres until September, which I think Dr White mentioned in her opening remarks. But and I have a feeling I know what all your answers will be. How important do you think it is that the Chamber meets physically and what that does in terms of the participation of members and the the theatre of parliament if you if you will um and also um around spontaneous intervention there is an element of very genuine feeling ac across the house that actually being able to intervene think on your feet is actually quite important to parliamentary debate so i just wonder what your what your views would be on that and i know i think Dr. White mentioned the Brazilian parliament, so it's good that we can learn something positive from, from Brazil, maybe their parliament rather than their president in responding to the, to the pandemic. But I'd be interested to know of any other examples um, across world parliaments where that spontaneity has been able to develop. Dr. Fox, do you want, uh, Dr. White, do you want to come in? It looked like you were nodding. <laughs> like I was drawing breath. Um, yes, yeah, so I think, um, you know, the point is well rehearsed in your ev the evidence you've already taken that you know spontaneity is uh, a great uh, benefit in making sure that debate is effective. Um, it is already the case if you look at many other parliaments um, where interventions aren't possible, um, or uh, indeed international assemblies. You know members turn up, they read a speech. It may be the same as the speech that you know three or four other people before them have just made, but they weren't there to hear it, and they you know they're not engaging in an actual debate. And I think that the um, the, the the to and fro and the interventions and so on are very important. Um, for me, though, I think you know if it if it comes down to um, as it did um, a, a decision between um, allowing for for better quality debate and allowing for all members to participate in um, debate, um, I 
personally would have elected for allowing all members to participate over improving the quality of the debate that happens. It, it, it troubled me at the time that the House took a decision to say that a large number, you know, and at the time, you know, they weren't even going to be allowed um, to, to participate in a hybrid proceeding or, 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 or to, to vote and, and were just being told that they would be able to pair. It troubled me that the um, House made that decision to say we're okay with the fact that um, in order to allow for a better quality of debate, um, a large number of elected members of Parliament will not be able to participate. Chris, well, if I can, can I just bring Kevin Jones in in the room? Sorry, this one of the joys of trying to chair a virtual meeting. Well, Kevin well, has a point on that, and then I'll bring Chris in. Well, I, th again. I think it's a, a broader point uh, that I made earlier on is, is that it's turned us into people coming in and reading into the record rather than debate. And I think it's a tendency which has been creeping in slowly, I think, since we put time limits on debate, uh, time limits on speakers. Now, I might sound like an old fossil like Christopher here, but uh, the fact of the matter is that the old, the, old, the old system worked very well in which you often didn't get called in a debate. I can remember waiting to make my maiden speech, waited six hours and didn't get called. But then the system worked because the next debate, you're always called high up the debate. And I think the danger, I think, with a lot of new members is there's an expectation that if you put in for a debate, you actually have, you will get called. And that never was the case. And I think the problem, I think, with possibly this coming in so soon after general election, expectations might be raised amongst new members that, one, they expect to get in, and secondly, that the three-minute contribution is the way forward. If that gets into the psyche of the place, I think it will kill debate going forward. I think in terms of the uh, other thing which has crept in very clearly over the last few years is people reading speeches which, again, I'm sure it, when Chris was first selected, I was, and you were actually pulled up for reading, sitting reading speeches. But that is just a matter now of accepted behaviour. And I think it does break up the debate, because if we are a debating chamber, that's about listening to the debate and obviously making your points, but responding to it. And as I said earlier on, it's not just backbenchers. Government ministers now often turn up with a pre-prepared speech uh, and what they do is they tend to uh, possibly make a list of who spoke and mention them, but don't actually talk about what they've actually done. I know when I was a minister, all I used to do is I used to have an opening paragraph and a closing paragraph and sat and made notes throughout the debate. And that's, I think, but that is not the case now, uh, which leads to, in terms of accountability of the executive, uh, it, it, I, I think, it, it, I think it, it's not good practice. Especially if you add to that, you've got front bench opposition spokesmen who do exactly the same in turn up and read, read a speech into the record that might mention that X and Y spoke in the debate, but don't actually refer to what they actually said. And I think, I don't know how we get back to uh, what we are as a debating chamber and not uh, just a, a forum for people to read set texts into the speech, yep. into, a, into, the, into the debate. Thanks, Kevin. Chris, do you want right. to... Yeah, just, just on the, the sort of, sort of second part of the question, and actually to agree with Kevin in relation to call lists, there are lots of members of all parties who think the call lists mean that um, you'll get called definitely, no matter how long the speaker controls the timing of the chamber, which everyone seems to ignore. People don't seem to acknowledge that there are X number of Labour, SNP, Green, Clyde, Conservative members, but obviously there's a payroll vote who can't speak because you know, they, they, they're bound by the rules of the House. So I, I wonder what you think about publishing call lists, because th there's a debate about whether they're effective or not. And also, as Kevin says, what it also means is people are going in, they know they're in for three minutes, they no longer have to stay in the chamber, they no longer have to listen to opening remarks, and that's all because of the pandemic. But actually, th there is a logic to saying that when this ends, whenever it may end, even if we go to a one metre distance in the chamber, that actually it's quite important to be in the chamber to hear what a minister has to say, or if a minister is responding to you, or an official opposition spokesperson is, is responding to what you said, if we can improve the response mechanisms that, that Kevin has mentioned. As with the call list, it says, oh, well, I've not been called, forget it, I'm not going to bother, when actually a significant part of a member of parliament's job is to speak in the chamber and represent their constituents, even if it's to a minute intervention that allows you to raise a constituency issue. 
example, I think on, the call, was on the call list for this afternoon. Uh, Seventy-one members on the call list for this afternoon, and we know that Owen Thompson, I think, is number twelve on the call list. So we'll be going shortly to join that. But it does mean that it's not a debate if you're not sitting, listening to openings and closings and speeches, some time before yours, even if you're in to listen to the speech before yours. But Dr. Uh, Professor Russell, did you have some response to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I've, I've. I've I've always been a bit agnostic on the idea of speakers lists and I think the advertisement that we've seen for them in the Commons recently and in the Lords as well has not been a particularly good one. I've also, uh, for the record, never been um, an advocate of electronic voting. Um, I'm a bit of a traditionalist in that regard. I think yeah, that the opportunity yeah. to grab the minister in the lobby and all of that, I go along with all of that. But needs must. You know, we are in this extraordinary situation. We have to be pragmatic. And obviously these things were brought in in, in, the re in recent circumstances for a reason. I think that with respect to, um, you know, the spontaneity and all of that is clearly very important and something, something, something very valuable has been lost in recent times. But I noted, and I think I completely agree um, with what you said in, your, in this committee's report of the 30th of May, that there may be a need for some compromise here between principles. I completely agree with Hannah um, in general, that equality of participation is an absolutely key principle, and particularly with respect to voting. But you did suggest in that report um, that the parity of treatment principle might be loosened a bit, and I think that that could be the case um, in terms of management of the chamber currently. What you can't do is push that so far as you know, I've been saying this rather uh, like, a, like a stuck record, uh, so far as it went on the 2nd of June, uh, whereby you take the vote away from certain people. I mean, I note that the, the government's evidence to you, all of its forms of evidence to you, um, are leaning very heavily on the fact that the, the House agreed to end these proceedings on the 2nd of June. Technically, that might be true. But I would say that actually that vote was invalid and illegitimate because so many people were excluded. So, you know, there's a limit to how far you can push these principles. If I can bring Liz Twist in now, who wants to ask a question specifically about proxy voting, and then we'll go on to business outside the chamber. Liz. Yes, thank you. And we've already touched on this. I think all of you have touched on this already in your evidence. So it's really, um, you know, whether you could give us your assessment of how satisfactory the socially distanced voting system is that's in place um, at the present. And, you know, going on to that from that, um, looking at the proxy voting system for those unable to attend the House, and how satisfactory do you think that is? I think I've got an idea on that one, but if you'd like to comment. Uh, who wants to go with this one? Uh, does Dr Fox want to take this one? Not happening yet. Um, so I, I think we're clear in our, our evidence that the the electronic voting, remote voting system should have been retained, and proxy voting is uh, an unacceptable alternative to that, in my view, for the kind of reasons that that Meg has outlined. Um, I also think there is a, a slightly odd. Uh, situation here where the, the leader of the house sort of talked in, and closed the voting process in almost sort of quasi religious terms as this sort of this great experience that um, had to be protected and you couldn't be uh, doing anything other than walking through the lobbies or on the parliamentary estate but then the solution that they uh, they came up to it came up with in their u-turn was a proxy vote system which hands you know, all the votes of the MPs to uh, to to the whips in advance of the vote and in advance largely of the debate. So it just seems to me a, a, a really quite ridiculous debate, um, and particularly given the amount of effort and time that had been put in to deliver a system against expectations that worked so well, and then to pay even more money and and spend more resources to come up with an alternative. That in the card reader system that was frankly less uh, less useful. Um, and my understanding is one of the problems with the proxy voting system is the complexity of, of running it and tallying all the results alongside the card reader data. So as a consequence, it's, it takes longer to, to work out, it takes longer to publish the results. I think we saw a mistake in, the, in one of the votes last week. Um, so all in all, I think it's, it's an utterly inadequate solution. 
Dr. White. Now, can I just add um, that I think that it's also um, confusing to me that, you know, the, the, the leader put a lot of emphasis on the need for the House of Commons to return in order to set an example to the country that, you know, things were getting back to normal. Um, but and and I understand that the you know the card reader system of voting is more efficient and faster and, and than the original conga votes, which I think is 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 good news. But it's clear from watching the votes um, and and clear that the public are watching the votes and seeing that social distancing is is difficult. Um, and I think that it is a poor example for the House of Commons to be setting to the nation that there was an electronic um, system which was entirely self, safe from a health point of view which has been set aside in favour of uh, a system where it is difficult to socially distance. And I think that poses a health risk to members and it poses a reputational risk to the House of Commons. Chris Selmer, I think, um, has some information about what happened with the vote last week that might be useful to members of the committee as well. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Chair. L last week, which, is, which was mentioned in the, in, the, in the statement then, there was a uh, proxy vote um, issued by the SNP Chief Whip, um, and, and you know this is this is all sort of public in the sense that this was queried afterwards. Um, those thirty votes, I think Owen will help me on that because Owen is an SNP Whip, um, weren't accounted for by the teller. So um, several hours later, um, or that, or certainly later that evening, that was picked up by the House authorities. Uh, to be clear, the government weren't close to losing, but it certainly narrowed the gap quite significantly. But what it meant was when the vote was declared, um, the, despite the fact that we were sort of querying it live, if you want, you know, from, from behind the Speaker's chair and in the Whip's office, um, they, they, they were 30 odd members on Hansard that voted that weren't actually read out in the chamber. Chope has a question on pairing, and then I know Professor Russell did want to come back in, so I'll bring Professor Russell back in. But Sir Christopher, yes, I'd be interested in your views about uh, putting fresh emphasis on the pairing system as it used to be when I first became a member back in 1983, um, and in that Parliament and in the following Parliament, um, pairing was the norm, and you'd have relatively small numbers of votes actually with participation in the chamber or in, in, in the commons because people would be paired unless it was a, a genuine three-line whip there'd be a two-line whip which would enable uh, them uh, to be able to absent themselves either on, away on parliamentary delegations or select committee visits or private family things or even because they were they they were ill and the public accepted that uh, it wasn't necessary for an mp to be voting in every division in order to be able to show that they were doing their job. And it seems to me that uh, we need to go back to that. And our chairman mentioned when we were discussing this earlier that she thought the genie was out of the bottle and that the public would never accept that uh, members shouldn't be voting in every division um, that, that was available. But I, I would argue that we should try and educate the public into seeing this in the wider perspective. And I'm wondering whether you think there's any scope for trying to educate the public uh, about the, the fact that members can be active members of parliament without actually having to participate in every vote. Professor Russell. Well, in response to that, I think there's a place for pairing um, in its traditional way. If somebody comes down with a short-term illness or has, has a family emergency or something like that, that on a, um, you know, on a, 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 in a small number of cases, people are paired. But I absolutely don't think it's the answer in this situation. Ruth and I touched on this in the blog post um, from April that's been referred to several times. I mean, one of the, diff one of the difficulties with pairing um, is that you're marked down as absent, um, and members want their vote to be on the record. Um, and the other one is, of course, that it's even less flexible than, the pro than proxy voting by whips. I mean, as I understand it, despite the fact that whips are holding some of the votes, there has been at least one instance, maybe several by now, um, of a whip casting votes in two different ways if they've been instructed to do so by the member. And I, I welcome that. Um, with pairing, it's simply assumed that you're going to vote the party line. So I, I absolutely don't think that that's the answer large scale in this situation. Um, that the only thing that I was going to say when I put my hand up just now on, on the previous point about the card reader system was I was so struck when I read your evidence from last week. It was the evidence with the clerk, but I think it was Matthew Hamlin 
who answered the question about the amount of staff time that is going in behind the scenes to tallying up even just the card reader system, leaving aside the proxy voting system and the, the little kind of quiet plea that was written between the lines of his evidence as to how the, the system which they put so much time and energy into setting up for the remote voting um, created the division list instantly. And I say that as somebody who, as I say, has never been a supporter of electronic voting, but you clearly had a very efficient system that was working for the circumstances. Um, and now you've got a rather inefficient one. Can I come quick, quick, quick back on your, your answer to, to the point about um, pairing? Why should it be a problem for members to be marked as absent? It's only a problem because we've allowed the public to regard it as important in all circumstances, when I'm suggesting that it's not important in all the circumstances. What is important is that the members of Parliament participate in their activities in a conscientious way. For example, the Prime Minister has, has not been exercising um, proxies and he's not been physically voting a lot, but people will understand that uh, he shouldn't be criticised for not being uh, present and actually uh, voting. And similarly, uh, that applies to a whole host of other members, or can do. Do you want me to respond to that? Uh, well, Dr Fox, perhaps you, others will like you want to come in. Hmm. I, I was just going to say, I mean, I admire Sir Christopher's optimism about the, uh, the possibilities in terms of educating the public about some of the complexities. But you know, by and large, the, the, most members of the public don't give an awful lot of thought to how MPs vote, unless they're, of course, confronted with pictures on the front pages of the, of the conga line. Um, you know, we know from our audit of political engagement that most mem members of the public struggle to differentiate between government and parliament. Um, I mean, and in, but in a world in which particularly, you know, you have these data sites monitoring the activities of parliamentarians, when you have media particularly doing data monitoring of the activities of MPs and sort of compiling reports on that, I, I think it probably unrealistic to expect that you know, in the coming years, we're gonna educate them away from focusing on those things. But if we were to try, I think the focus should be more on working with some of the organizations like They Work For You and the media, rather than sort of pitching this idea of, of educating the public in the broadest sense. I think some targeted work by the house to engage with the the, the, the mediators, if you like, of this information that push these messages out to the public would be a better option. Could I, help, could I enlist your help on this? <laughs> the Hansel Society? Quite possibly, but um, we'd have to have a conversation. Liz Twist wants to make a quick comment, then we must yeah. move on because I'm conscious of time. Yeah, it's really just one very quick one, looking at the different methods of, mo of voting. Uh, I mean, really, whether you think that the current arrangements uh, or pairing arrangements have a disproportionately, uh, you know, unequal impact upon, um, say, women members or members with disabilities. Hannah, do you want to come in, Dr. White? Yes, just to say that. Yes, I think one of the the um, benefits of um, uh, proxy voting is, um, you know, to enable people to to participate. Um, and have their vote registered um, in votes where they wouldn't otherwise be able to for whatever reason, whether that's because of caring responsibilities, disability or, or, or something else of that nature. Okay. Can we move on now to, um, to just considering uh, business outside the House? And Anthony Magnall has a question about select committees. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, our, our witnesses and experts. It's fantastic to hear your, your views and thoughts on this. Um, I, I, as we are doing now, virtually, I think it's been um, it's proven to be quite a useful system to be able to have select committees meet by virtual process. So is this something um, you feel should carry on? And also, what happens outside of recess? I mean, certainly during the pandemic, we're going to have a period where the government is responding to and um, producing a significant amount of advice. So do you think there is a sort of remit that uh, the committee, select committee, should be meeting outside of parliamentary sitting times as well? Whoever would like to go with that. I'll... Dr. White, do you Can want I to come in there? Come... Shall I come in there? Um, yes, I think um, I would say I definitely do think that the ability for committees to sit virtually if they wish to do so um, or in, in a hybrid way so that, you know, certain members who have responsibilities, you know, some other they're on a delegation or whatever, 
um, want to participate in uh, a meeting should be able to continue to do so after this. I think that should be um, preserved. I think one of the problems that we sometimes saw um, in the pre-coronavirus era was some committees meeting with very few members because you are all so busy and you have so many multiple um, engagements. And, and it may be, you know, sometimes that it's not that you're actually doing something, but you're, you know, you're traveling or whatever, and you might be able to, to participate virtually in a meeting. Um, so I think we might see an increase in attendance at um, select committees uh, if some kind of virtual um, ability to meet were were sustained. I think it's it's really good from a, the point of view of diversity of witnesses that people who can't necessarily travel to, to Westminster, um, whether from overseas um, or um, from elsewhere within the, the, the UK will be able to participate as witnesses. And I also think that for, for some um, sort of more diverse witnesses, younger witnesses, dare I say, <laughs> um, who are more sort of um, digitally inclined, giving evidence um, via video link is, is potentially for them a more comfortable milieu than walking into the um, uh, Pugin flocked uh, wallpaper I can see behind you, <laughs> Mr. Magnol. Um, and, and, you know, and they're quite, um, uh, you know, in, in more um, austere circumstances, they might feel more comfortable giving evidence to you, so you might get different quality evidence. Um, so I think there are lots of um, good reasons uh, to, to keep it. And I think that sitting in a recess, I mean, subject to the point that, um, you know, your staff have all been re working really hard and they, <laughs> Um, you know, uh, the last thing they want to hear is is people telling them that they ought to be running lots of committee meetings all, all through the recess. Um, actually, I think that uh, I did some research a few years back and um, then it was relatively un uncommon for, for committees to meet um, in, in the recess. And I was talking to them about the Home Affairs Committee and a number of people spontaneously said to me that when the select uh, the Home Affairs Committee had held a meeting during the summer recess when there had been riots in England and had held the, the, the police to account, it had been really um, important to them in terms of um, a sense that somebody was holding um, you know, the powers that be to account, that there was a, a democratic uh, remit that members were fulfilling, which continued to be um, done during the recess and that members thought it was important to be able to do that. So subject to the workload issue for you and for, for staff, I think the possibility of meeting the re in the recess um, is really important. I, I want to come back. Chair, can I come back in if that's right? Um, and, and yes, it's a good thing I'm not trying to pretend that this is my sitting room wall <laughs> or something along those lines. Um, however, um, I, I think, I mean, I think one of the things I find quite interesting is that the fact that many of the select committees, of course, including this one, have a huge degree of clout. You know, appearing before one is a very significant request, and far be it for me to stand in front of the winds of change. Um, but that said, to, to ensure that we are properly holding people to account, I don't feel that a sort of invitation to a Zoom account, and this is not to detract from the fantastic evidence that you are all giving us, um, is perhaps as effective in terms of getting the answers that we may necessarily need. Um, and I wonder if you, you know, and on, and on the basis of everything you've just said, do you not think that if you were to go down that route, you would have to be extremely specific about the um, viability of a witness coming to give evidence virtually? And for us, not to, there would have to be a, a sort of extenuating circumstances to allow us not to meet physically. Obviously, a, a, a pandemic is one of them, but that's the measure that we would have to go to before we just necessarily accept that there is an ease to be able to go on virtually rather than the requirement and the clout that comes with these committees. I think that is, that is a good point. And um, I think it would need to be up to committees and committees would need to be able to request for people to appear in, in person. But I also think if you think back to some of the examples of um, uh, people who have uh, created trouble, should we say, in the past about appearing before committees and have often f found that it's very difficult to, to find the time in their diary to do so, or they've not been um, in, you know, in the right physical location to be able to come and give evidence in person, and they've resisted that. Um, having the option as a committee to be able to say, well, in that case, on this occasion, we would be willing to take ev evidence by video link might be actually an additional tool in your, um, in your toolbox. Professor Russell, did you want to come in? Well, I was only going to say, I mean, I think that Hannah's made some terrifically good points. I don't disagree with anything that she said, but I also have sympathy with what Anthony Magnall's saying. Um, and it feels to me like this would be a good topic for you to give consideration to. I'm sure you'll be thinking about 
questions about the longer term implications and you know future future lessons um i think there's general agreement on the panel that a greater use of virtual um, participation in select committees in future than we have seen traditionally in the past would be a good thing but i do think that you know we've we've heard a lot about spontaneity and you know there are questions of sort of non-verbal communication and so on those apply to select committees just as they apply you know in a different way but they apply in select committees as well as in the chamber and so i think if select committees went all virtual that would be a loss so i think that maybe you need to be thinking about yes the circumstances in which witnesses are allowed to give evidence virtually and perhaps also the circumstances in which members are allowed to participate virtually is it because they're absent for particular kinds of business I and mean, somebody was mentioning um you know an overseas visit or something like that is it in the case of illness or whatever could they be allowed a certain number of virtual um, um participations isn't a word could they be allowed to be allowed to participate virtually a certain limited number of times a year or something like that it feels to me like those are the kinds of things that your committee might want to think through in terms of setting out a framework for the future and um, i'm very conscious that we've kept you already 10 minutes both longer than we told you we'd be keeping you but we've just got a few questions just to wrap up about the house control of its own procedures if i can bring in nigel mills um, and then and then I promise we will let you go and uh, go and do what you need to do with the rest of your day. Nigel. Can I just take you back to the earlier comments on House Business Committees, which I think the Chair and I have both put on a manifesto commitment for in 2010, which is like a long time ago, doesn't it? Um, we had the same situation after the Whitson recess of the House not almost not not being able to have a vote on how it wanted to vote because the government wouldn't lay a motion which would enable the House to have had the vote. Would you agree that whatever else we think of House business committees, the House ought to be deciding conduct of the House matters and not the government having a, an effective veto by just refusing to table a motion in that situation? Dr Fox, do you want have to? You... Yes, <laughs> I mean, I, I think... I think... Um, we're probably agreement across the piece, and I think Meg had already sort of articulated this that um, that the House should have far more control over what happens to it, and that that can be done through a vote. And if the government has a majority and can carry the day on the merits of the argument, so be it. Um, but that will not always necessarily be the case, and shouldn't be assumed. And is your view that House businesses and how the House conducts itself should not generally be heavily whipped votes? And we had a drift towards house business not being a free vote when it probably was 10 years ago. You're not, not too fussed on that either way. My preference would be that it would be free votes uh, as, as previously, but as you say, I think that that, that drift has, got, has, has gone the other way slightly. Um, but ultimately, you know, it is for members individually to decide. Um, and, the, you know, the, the preference ought to be in favour of a free vote. I agree. Yes, and I agree too. And again, this might be a useful topic for you uh, for future considerations. It's a terribly big topic. Um, I think that we saw, we've seen difficulties over this undoubtedly recently um, with respect to the, the events which we've discussed at length. I think we also saw this to some extent during the Brexit process with the government failing to bring things forward, withdrawing things to avoid awkward votes and so on. So I, I think it's a, it's, it's a general topic which is ripe for reconsideration sort of 11 years after the right committee reported. And I think one important thing that could be done through that, through, through that inquiry in a report would be to set out exactly that what happened in the past because I think one of the concerns I have is that there's been such a turnover in the house in terms of membership um, and I think only I think about 25 26 percent of the members of the house were there prior to 2010 and obviously the last decade has been a very different decade in terms of how the house has operated um, so in some ways it'd be quite useful to set out how things previously worked and how they've evolved over the last uh, the last few years yes it's often easy to over romanticize the past i re i remember various sort of soft three line whips on things in the past um you know, the whips have not been totally uninvolved in these decisions but i think they were always officially free votes um, until fairly recently <laughs>
Thank you very much. Um, we have an enormous number of other questions we could ask you, an enormous number of other topics we could ask you about. We're very grateful for the evidence you've given us and also your written evidence. Um, if there's anything else that you'd like to add to uh, the work we're doing as a result of this, uh, perhaps thoughts that you have post this meeting, you're very welcome, obviously, to write to us. But can I thank you for your participation um, and some very enlightening and thoughtful and thought-provoking contributions. Thank you very much. Order, order.